this is okay. Good. Okay. So, I mean, how we di didn't discuss before uh, how we should uh, organize our lecture with uh, Nikona Shank on the because he were focused on f fishing. But uh, fortunately, we were found that uh, we are very well uh, coordinated. So he helped me quite a lot to introduce already the density function. And the way we presented is also quite similar. He started from the observation, so as I do. And uh, yesterday we discussed about the nuclear ground state property and also the notational states. And then today we were going on, for example, there are all, also a lot of uh, nuclear excitation properties based on different reactions. And then they, all of this could be also, will be a target for the relativity density function. And in particular, I just cho choose this, for example, this spin iso spin resonance. Uh, this is very important because the spin iso spin reson uh, resonance essentially it tell us about three subjects. There's abolic, uh, isobaric analog states and kampf taylor transition and spin dipole resonance. And of course, you will see this is very important because it will tell us something about the, the for example, the Bethika half knife and also in particular nowadays people talking about the double beta decay or neutralities double beta decay. That is already a hot topic in not only in nuclear physics, but also in particle physics as well. And all of this definitely would be discussed or described properly uh, in the relativity density functional theory. And of course, on top of that, one should also combine with some uh, approach or technicals developed based on the uh, so-called phenomenological model or the other approaches. And then maybe all of you know this halo phenomenon. Halo phenomenon is very important topics. But uh, can anybody give me a definition what is a halo phenomenon? Right? So next year may be very important year for this uh, halo phenomenon because the so-called halo phenomenon was observed almost 40 years ago. The, the idea of this halo phenomenon come from the advance of the technologies, which was called, uh, so-called, the signaling beams. Signaling beams, that means there must be a preliminary beams. In preliminary beams, we have an accelerator, we accelerate the nucleus. But this nuclear we could accelerate is quite limited, right? Only the stable nuclear, we could ionize the atoms and then accelerate that as a preliminary beams. The, this kind of choice is quite limited. And in order to understand the structure, we have to use the preliminary beams reacting with other nuclear in such a way we could get this information. And then the observation of the of the Helen phenomenon was done by a Japanese physicist, Isao Tanihata. And he is a Japanese physicist. He got his PhD in Osaka University, and that time he moved to Berkeley National Lab as a postdoc. He stayed there for eight years. For eight years, I don't know how many how many eight years one have 
scientifically. But during these eight years, according to what he told me, he worked with the famous Seberg. And what they do is that they developed this secondary beam techniques. The first of all, they they build the accelerator in such a way that uh, they they put the the preliminary beam to very high energy, then bombarding on some nucleus. Yes, they we already mentioned up. Uh, we already heard about the compound nuclear. Instead of the compound nuclear, this is a very high energy, high energy beams. This high energy beams here will be fragmented, right, into different pieces. And then these different pieces, they were to choose, they were developed a way to separate the fragments. And then use these fragments as uh, signal beams to do nuclear reaction, right? And then after they succeeded to develop this approach, the easiest way for them you see in this figure, this figure, the horizontal line is the mass number, right? The horizontal line is the mass number And then the vertical line is so-called the radius. That's why yesterday we were talking about the radius. Because we know the radius is proportional to the A to the one-third. And in the nature for the initial mass top, there are not so many stable beams. So using this redact M beam techniques, they couldn't produce or they could produce the beam from nitium six to nitium eleven. And then nitium ten doesn't exist. This nitium nine, this is ten here, and the nine, eight, seven, six. This more or less follows this trend to the one third. But if you go to the initium 11, immediately you will see a big change. And this is the observation in 1985. And that time is not so easy. If you go into the literature, you are well found Heino is not that famous in for the first ten years. People have a different diff, people have a difficulty to understand this phenomena, right? People have a difficult to understand this phenomena. Then first thing is that uh, you know for the stable nuclear, we could use electron scattering. And then using the electron scattering, we can more or less, yesterday we were talking about the nuclear size, is more or less the measurement of the charge distribution inside the nucleus. Then we can get precisely the nuclear charge radius. But for this kind of the unstable nuclear, it's very difficult to measure the, the size. And these people, they invented a good techniques. For example, they use these beams to bombard on carbon-12, right? And then for the ca carbon-12, if you do the bombarding of carbon-12 to bomb carbon-12, then you will see if the energy is extremely high, their cross-section cross should be proportional to the to the radio of carbon twelve plus carbon twelve square. This is a kind of the 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 scanning of the 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 cross section. 
and then they use this kind of scanning, scanning te techniques. One can extract the so-called the, the radius of this unstable nuclear. And then with this unstable nuclear, you immediately they found the big change of the radius from lithium-9 to lithium-11. This is a big surprise to the Nuclear Physics Society. A couple of years ago, uh, Professor uh, Angela Brakoska, uh, she organized a, a lot of uh, school on this uh, exotic nuclear to attract the people here to join this field. Because from this result, you could see that even if we believe in the textbook, the textbook told us the size of the nucleus is proportional to the A to the one third. But from this measurement, you will see the lead of the initium in Ivan is comparable to the size of night 208. So this is a big surprise. Even though today there's still a lot of measurement need to be done. For example, this halo means all you see according to this picture, we have the core, that's the nitium nine, and then outside there is so called the the weakly bound two neutrons. This weakly bound neutron contribute greatly to the density, uh, to the size of the lithium-9. And uh, you know, this, this density is not uh, so, you know, so, so dense as a core. Therefore, it looks like a halo around the nuclear. So that's why it's called halo nuclear. But uh, quantitatively, it's difficult to define what is the halo? Because from measurement, from measurement, you see from this so-called the, the, the cross-section, they put it a name called the interaction cross-section. This interaction cross-section, what you measure is the size, not really the density inside the nucleus. Of course, indirectly, you can use some model to, to indirectly extract the density distribution. But then it will be turned out that could be density model dependent, right? Therefore, although this observation of the halo phenomena really give, give nuclear physics a big surprise, but meanwhile, it's also a lot of questions to be answered. Therefore, that's why all the wide, you see all the wide, a lot of facility are constructing all the wide. And for example, the, in Japan, the leaking RABF, they call it radioactive. By the way, radioactive, that's the same, same as signaling ion beam, sometimes called radioactive ion beam. So this is called a radioactive M beam, uh, radioactive M beam factory. That is uh, in Japan, and uh, the first beam in radioactive beam in Duiken come out about in December two o o six, almost uh, fifteen or eighteen years ago. And then recently in U.S. Uh, in in Michigan State University, this FLIP facility for rear isotope beam is sound more in interesting because the rear means something really precious, right? So rear isotope beam sounds more attractive to the public because people are afraid of this radioactivity. So rear isotope beam seems Sounds better. And also, in, for example, in Germany, 
This fair project is under construction in Korea. They will soon finish this building. And also in China, in very close to Hong Kong, uh, about 200 kilometers, there is also a big facility under, under construction. And uh, it costs something like 33 billion Chinese yuan. 3 billion, that is all less equivalent to 500 million dollars. So you feel thinking about this order, that is more or less the money needed to build this uh, radioactive facilities. And in particular in Korea, you know, before in Korea, there are not so many nuclear physics activity. But with this discovery or the, the observation of the halo phenomena, even in Korea, a lot of people are working in this field. Or underneath, they attract, of, attract a lot of people working in this field. There are several people from GSI, Darmstadt, and then they, you will see the fair project. It cost something like $2 billion. This is the most expensive part. One, another part is we are investigated the antimatters, right? So that's also interesting because later on, if I have enough time, I will talking about the antimatter within the relativistic framework. I mean, how from this, you will see that in nuclear physics, there are already a lot of phenomena the waiting to be explained or wait to be interpreted. And then, theoretically, can, what can we do? You see, in previous lecture, Nick Van Shank has already told us, you know, how this Mic Mac models, we also call the finite range drop model, you know, how they works well for not only the nuclear ground property, but also for fishing as well and so on. But then you will see, essentially, we study from some interaction and then we use some uh, so-called the mean potential to solve these problems. And uh, sometimes I call this as the first generation of nuclear model, or for first generation of, mod, uh, of nuclear model in, in this field. But uh, with the time going on, we should try to give, go to the second step. What is the second generation of nuclear models? As you know, that there are always some phenomenology existing in nuclear theory and some neighbors. But what we are trying to do is eliminate this parameter or underneath, try to find some microscopic origin of this approach, of these models. So essentially, we, what we have solved is this main body Hamiltonians. From quantum mechanics, we already know how to solve this quantum uh, main body system. We have the, if we, for a nuclear, we have A nucleons, N proton, N neutron plus Z neutrons. So we have the so called the kinetic energy. And then we have also the interaction between the nucleons. Of course, if you here we cut off to two body force. There are also people talking about three body or four body and so on. That will make this things much more complicated, but conceptually, the treatment is the same. So for the first generation of this nuclear model, what we have done is that we introduce a mean potential. This mean potential, we put it here, and then the difference of the two-body interaction with the mean potential, we call that as a residual interaction. 
right? So in such a way, this part is what we know from Mayon Jensen. That is a shear model. What we more precisely, that should be called independent particle, independent particle shear model. If we take into account the residual interaction into account, treat this system more exactly, there are different approach, right? Essentially, that is the existing approach nowadays in nuclear physics. We have a different way. Somebody in the audience mentioned that they are working to with the so-called the local shear model. Local shear model, that means if you are rich enough, you have big computing facility, you have enough resources, then you could do local shear model or up initial concretion. You diagnose the, the, the previous main body Hamiltonian in a huge matrix. This is not so easy. Only this superpower like the US can do that. Maybe some European rich institute can also do that. Then, signally, if we cannot do that, then we do that in different way. Then, so to say, we call that shear model. This shear model is configuration interacting shear model. So we take into account the residual interaction in such a way, we don't take the full model space, we only take a small part of the model space, so the interaction should be modified in some way, or in fact there is a kind of effect, effective interaction, and then that is normally called a configuration, configuration interacting shear model. This is nice demanding for computing, for computing facility, but still very expensive. And remember that the mo at the end of the last century, after then returned back to China, and then I visited the University of Tokyo. And the Professor Otsuka invited me to visit his facility. He spent several million dollars and building a big computing network. And he, then he is very proud of that. He told me he could do this configuration interacting shear model. One of the richest in this configuration interacting shear model community. And after he introduced that, he told me, oh, but this is not for you. Because we belong to these poor people. What we should do is density functioning. In some sense, that's also correct. Because when I, when I was young, when I was a student, I should decide what to do. What to do. Experimental is more, even more expensive, so I choose to do theory. But even to do theory, we also need to pay the computation fee. It's not that cheap. Even today in China, computation fee is also very expensive one. And then our professor always told us, don't trust the big scale calculation. You should try to find the new physics. This is a way when you are poor, you can use these words to, to, you know, to comfort yourself to do physics. But in some sense, even though you are rich, thinking about physics more is also very important. I'm happy that I choose a density functional theory, which is not that bad, because it's the resources less demanding. And then you can think about how to improve your calculation, find some new ideas. That's also why. I like the history of the development of the model and also try to find some new observation or new discovery from experimenter 
in, that, in such a way that if you do everything from the first order approximation, if you could get the physics correct, then you can think about the second order. The first order always tell you something very interesting and should give you already the correct trend. Then you can go to the next step. I found that is also still useful today. And therefore, I always so assume density functional, including the relativity density functional, could be, you know, the starting point to building the standard model. And at least for myself, how to start it from density functional, then we can describe the observation. After I have this observation, we also try to improve the relativity density functional. For example, we can build that connection. Uh, Nick Shank mentioned that all these models are phenomenological and there's some level. But I have a dream. We are still, we are already working on that. Can we find some connection, for example, from the density functional to QCD? We are already working on that. We, we already have some progress and uh, give us enough time. Maybe we can some, find some good connections. Then with this, maybe we, I should introduce you to the covalent density functional theory. Right? So covalent density functional theory traditionally was also called the relativistic mean field. Or even before it was called the relativistic hard zone dynamics. But it have a different name, but nowadays the people maybe after the 90, end of the centuries, people call that density functional. It's also a kind of the, 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 the trend or the, the, so before I go that, I was, I also borrow this, uh, this uh, slide from Peter Nguyen, but because Peter Nguyen collecting all this uh, big contribution in nuclear physics in the 50s. In the 50s, you will see a lot of great physicists working in the, in the field of nuclear physics. There are really a, a lot of ideas coming to these fields. For example, you know this uh, Beta and Goldstone and uh, Bruckner, all of these people are trying to find a way to use so-called the bare interaction in the nuclear structure calculation. They try to improve in such a way that the, you know, the divergence due to the strong repulsion of the nuclear interaction could be avoided. And also in the 50s, you see the relativistic approach was already done by this several group of these people. By the way, three-body force, and also in China, in the 50s, for example, scum interaction was proposed in the 50s, and the Anima and Hoya was the first to, to, to do the configuration, mixing configuration. That is the so-called the beginning of configuration tracking shear model already in the 50s. And for the superconductivity, you will see uh, Nikola told us that, uh, you know, that uh, he were talking about Hartwig, but later on he were coming back, come to Hartwig Bogribov. Here the Bogribov also appears in, this, in, the, in the 50s. So we have BCS theory and also Bogribov transformation for the pending correlations. And also in China in the 60s, the people try to develop a particle number conserving approach to treat pain. And the, this kind of approach 
we found this, it is still very useful. In particularly, yesterday we mentioned about the pattern correlation. The pattern correlation, if you treat it by the Bogdanov transformation or the BCS approximation, you're always broken the particle number conservation. This could be serious in treating the finite system as a nucleus. In particularly, if you're talking about the proton-neutron pattern, you have only one single proton and one single neutron that will pair together. And then if you violate, the particle number is violated, then this could lead to a serious problem. So this particle number conservation is uh, approach nowadays it is so so useful, and then you know that uh, for example the Chinese version of interacting shear model or not sh shear model in convolution interacting shear model was also proposed in this approach, but unfortunately not on one of these key persons, one of these key persons. He was involved in the nuclear weapon project. Therefore, this this approach doesn't continue. I mean, how that uh, uh, this this gentleman he passed away already. He is uh, he contributed many to the construction of the H bombs in China, and he graduate from Peking University, and he's always working in China, never go abroad. And uh, he was regarded with one great physicist in China, which fully educated in China. So you will see that uh, in, the, in, the, in the 50s, there are already a lot of ideas. And then, what about the density functional theory? The density functional theory going back to the Hornberg coin theorem in 1964. This Hornberg coin theory mentioned that for, 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 a, for a quantum mechanical main body system, the exact energy of this quantum mechanical main body system could be written as a function of a local density. And they can prove that this function is universal and doesn't depend on the system, but only depending on the interaction. This kind of rating is not that trivial because you will see in this functional, in principle, this is a, you know, we can reduce the degree of freedom. If you have a body system, then the degree of freedom should be 3A. But if you written in such a way, then this functional is simply have a, have a, is a function of three volumes. So in such a way that we could obtain the exact solution by, by evaluation of the functional with respect to the densities. And therefore they finally got the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1998. And then in nuclear physics, Nuclear, nuclear, in nuclear physics, the nuclear density function was introduced by a so-called effect Hamiltonians. In fact, uh, this, introduction, this introducing of the effect Hamiltonian was done in the 70s, right? So we, at that time, we don't know we know already the exact nuclear neutron interaction cannot be solved so easily. Therefore, the people have started to use the so-called effective interaction. Then one of these things is definitely 
the scum interaction. So photon and blink, in fact, they already solved this scum density function. And that time they called the scum Hartwig. And they, they already solved that for spherical nuclear and so on. And then that time and the present, the nuclear density function, there are three categories. Two are very popular in nuclear physics now. Two are so-called non-relativistic technique. It's a scum density function or goni density function. The scum density function is zero range. Zero range is easy to handle numerically. Therefore, it's very popular, right? In nuclear physics, you will see a lot, there are a lot of scum people. And a goni is a finite, finite range. And the technically is more difficult. Another way is a covalent density function. And a covalent density function, I will tell you how this covalent density function was developed. And then, of course, nowadays the density function was popularly used in different fields. And uh, from this, from this, uh, from this uh, paper by Booker in in 2012, he has already has shown this figure. For example, how the density function was so popular in chemistry and uh, materials. So you will see a huge number of the paper published for years in chemistry or in material science, right? So every year there are, there are already several thousands. This is only come to 2010. And then if you, I suppose I have a new version there is a there is a workshop where we have all the density functional people from materials, chemistry, condensed matter, and nuclear physics come together. And then he told me that this figure he has a new version of these figures. In this new version of this figure, every year, the paper published in materials is more than twenty thousand. So you will see that this density functional approach is already become commercial in the field of the materials. And there are so many people using this density functional cube, which could be available in the, in the uh, you can buy it commercially, you can only modify something, then you can run the calculations. So the people running density functional calculation in other field is not so difficult as in your nuclear physics. Because in nuclear physics, as I will told you later, that essentially we have to de develop the code by ourselves. So as a nuclear theoretician, every day we are do, we starting from formula, we do derivation, and then we formulate the code and run the calculation. Everything must be done by ourselves. But if you're working in material science, you have a commercial code. You only put in some input file, and then immediately you can run the code. If you could and produce, you produce something interesting. Your citation is very really high because every year there are sev several thousand papers published. In all nuclear physics, maybe several hundred. Therefore, if you can counting the citation number, maybe all fields should be renormalized by a factor of 10 in order to compare with the field in condensed matter physics. Then, before I go into the relativity density functional theory, we should find some argument. 
why we should study in a diversity density function, right? So, from what I introduced you yesterday, I suppose you already have some feeling why we should do that. There are several reasons for that. The first, most important one is the spin of the potential. Could be produced automatically. Because this in nuclear physics is so important. Therefore, we should make the best use of this advantage. That means we have a spin of the potential. The second one is the we have the Rolential uh, covariance, which could help us to reduce the parameters, right? I mean, how in all kind of approach, try to reduce the parameter is the top important thing. So if you will have some inver invariance or symmetry, which help us to reduce the parameter is very important. The third reason is should spin symmetry, which I have mentioned yesterday. With this should spin symmetry, we can understand, with the relativistic approach, we can understand the should spin symmetry much better. Later on, I will talk about also spin symmetry for anti nucleons. Again, that is a natural extension of the relativistic approach. And then we have a better connection to the QCD. Couple of years ago, or maybe 20 years ago, the people using the QCD sum rule, they can prove that the strong vector or scalar potential about 400 MeV in nucleus is justified. And then we have could treat, we could consistently treat the time order fields. This is very important because yesterday we mentioned a lot of phenomena of nuclear notating. The nuclear notating system, normally they were broken the time the invariance symmetry. If time invariance is broken, then we immediately we, there will appear a kind of time order field. The time order field, non relativistically, it could be a problem because you need a new parameter for the time order field. But in the relativistic approach, the time order field is simply the special components of the vector potential. So that coefficient is already fixed. So that is the advantage. And then another one is the so-called the, the, uh, the, uh, the Bruckner calculation. You see, the Bruckner calculation is that we are starting from the bare nuclear nuclear interaction. Normally, we study from some bone potential like a bone ABC. If you do the calculation non relativistically, you will have this equation of state for symmetric nuclear matter is this. So, you will see it's the saturation point is far away from the empirical values. So if you're coating, uh, connecting the saturation point together, this is the famous coast line for Bruckner calculation. And therefore, if you do uh, non-relativistically uh, non Bruckner calculation, then immediately people realize they need a three-body force. I mean, how in order to get the saturation point. But if you do the relativistic calculation, then immediately you will see 
the situation is much more improved. Is much more improved. So all of this is a kind of evidence that uh, the reason why we should do relativistically. Uh, there are also a lot of more. I listed eight points, right? That's why we should treat the system relativistically, right? In fact, uh, if the people ask you why you want to treat the nuclear relativistically, then you should also ask why you treat it non-relativistically, right? But because you see, if, if you see we're talking about the bending energy, when you put the two nuclei together, the immediately we lose the energy, we get bending. That is already an relativistic effects. Okay, okay, good. So I'm questioning, if no question, that means you are fully convinced that all of you will study the relativistic business. Yes. Pardon? Oh, okay, okay. Because you see that uh, the marketing, the marketing, there are so many materials. So everybody with a simple uh, machine, they can reproduce, they can produce new materials. So they need the computation. But for nuclear physics, if you observe a new phenomenon, there is not so meaningful for the other people to repeat the concretion again. So essentially, all code is one time use only. You have to develop a new code for new physics. That is the reason. Yeah. But uh, nowadays, if you, you somehow, uh, for example, you can have some simple version of the relativistic density functional, and then you can start it with it, or simply play with that. Mm -hmm. No, not, uh, you know, some older version is always available, or basic thing is available. I mean, how that uh, may be today or tomorrow. Uh, one of my students will tell you or show you how to play with uh, a simple code to treat spherical nuclear and the nuclear matter. That is also the request of the organizer that we should have some practical code that uh, so that all the students can play with. Then later on, there are also some code available on the internet. You can download or, you know, to, to use that. Okay, so we have a five minutes break. <laughs> Okay, so I hope it works. So after we trust the relativity density functional theory, then we should see how that works. And then again, well, I should briefly remind you the histories of the relativity approach. And then of course, we can go back to Yukawa, so to see 
in already in 1935. Then, you know, we have the Mason exchange theories, right? So then since then, people try to formulate the nuclear theory with Mason exchange. But to use that in the relativistic approach is not that easy. Because in the 50s, there were already some calculations, but not so successful. Not so successful. Because they try to solve the so-called the field equation for myson and the nucleus. This is simply very difficult. And then in 60s, there are already a congregation of nuclear structure with the relativistic Hartree approach. And that time, the result seems to be good. But the only thing is that we don't know what kind of relativity. Nowadays, we, don't, we see we don't have the good density function. If we have a good density function now, then we can already have the good results. And then the famous story is still active in this field, but I don't know. This is Tidini and Weaker in 1974. They use the nonlinear coupling of the Meissong fields. Then they study the nuclear matter. And then apart from the normal saturation point in nuclear matter we have, they found another saturation point and a very high density. And uh, this is from physics or from the parameter, nobody knows, because no observation. If you go to extremely high density, then you can talk about the quark gluon plasma. But uh, for this density they are talking about, there are not so such things. And then, they, they really the, the, the milestone in this approach is Valachka in 1974. And uh, he introduced the, the renormalized and relativistic mean field with scalar and vector Mason fields. This is more nice than approaching the nowadays what we have normally used for the relativistic mean field. The key points or the main success of Valachka is because he found this scalar potential which provides the attractive part of the nuclear nuclear interaction. The vector meson provided the repulsive part. So this is main success. And then with this, I should say that uh, uh, this, this approach has a serious problem because they give an incompressibility of nuclear matter about 500. Nowadays, we know the incompressibility of nuclear matter is about 200 or 220 plus minus something. So in order to solve this problem, and then Bogota and uh, Baudemeyer, they introduced the nonlinear coupling of the Masons. And then after they introduced the nonlinear coupling of the Sigma Masons, this problem with incompatibility was solved. So we understand nowadays for this relativistic approach, we need a nonlinear coupling of the Masons. Or in some modern language, we see nuclear nuclear interaction should be density dependent. And then let on Sealot in 1979, Sealot introduced no Masons. And then you see. This no Meson and the pi Masons, they are iso spin Masons. So we can distinguish proton and neutron. 
in such a way that relativistic for nuclear is more or less, more or less established. So the nuclear relativistic mean field with sigma, omega, and no meson was founded. So in principle, that is already the studying of the, you can study the describable nuclear property with this relativistic mean field. And uh, then there are already a lot of application. So for example, the famous story is Blockman and Toki. They studied from the relativistic bruckner hartree concretion for nuclear matter. And then the mapping the density dependence of the effect interaction to the mesons. So this work is very important is in the sense they already studied from some, nowadays we call it up initial calculation and uh, connected them to the relativistic mean field. But large scale application of a nuclear the relativistic mean field for nuclear physics is not studied yet, right? And the, it is studied about uh, in 1986, about uh, more or less 40 years ago. More or less for 40 years ago. It's very interesting because at that time, the people tried to solve try to use this relativistic approach, relativistic mean field, to study deformed nuclear. You see, at that time, the people were very careful. Even study the deformation of a neon 20. Three group of people independently, they applied, they applied the relativistic mean field to investigate the deformation of Leon 20. Very interesting. And then among these three group, uh, the first paper is from Frankfurt. Unfortunately, the calculation was wrong. So in this paper, in this conclusion, they mentioned that the relativistic approach cannot be applied to describe deformed nuclear. Fortunately, there is two, two groups. One group is from Munich, another group is from is by Price and Walker. They found they applied the same approach in relativistic mean field for Leon 20. Then the, the, they achieved the same results. They achieved the same results. And then they write a comment to, to this paper, and then finally they give a correction. That uh, so far, the relativistic mean field was uh, proved to be correct for deformed nuclear. I should mention here the approach Using by this three group of people are totally different, are totally different, because at that time, the developing of the code is not started yet. The first group, they try to solve the equation of motion in coordinate space, which is not so easy. Even today, it's still not that easy. And then the Munich group. They have the tradition to solve the 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 scum or the you know they solve the the traditional nuclear physics problem. So they are expert in harmonic oscillator. So they expanding everything in harmonic oscillator basis. So they are succeeded. The third group try to solve the equation of motion by you know couple channel approach. All of them are, all of this real approach are 
nowadays when used for nuclear physics. But at that time, you will see because the harmonic oscillator expansion is so efficient, so the Munich become very dominant in the application of the relativistic mean field. And meanwhile, you will see different parameter site was developed. The different mean uh, parameter site, we also call it different relativistic density function was developed because there are totally several parameters should be determined. For example, the Meissen mass, we don't know, right? The Meissen mass, in particular, the sigma Meissons. So this is the parameter. And then the coupling constant between the nuclear and the Meissen is not known. It should be also fitted. We have sigma, omega, no Meissen. That's three parameter. And we have sigma Meissen, we don't know, that's four. We have also introduced the nonlinear coupling of the Meissen. And this, we should introduce the nonlinear coupling of the sigma Meissen. So we add another two. So underneath, we need four, uh, six parameters, right? But later on, you will see this six parameter is already very successful <coughs> or very useful to describe a nuclear physics. And then later on, you will see a lot of people, this is, this is in this work, the deformed nuclear, that means they breaking the spherical symmetry, right? They breaking the spherical symmetry. By the way, and uh, Professor Peter Nguyen always told uh, the people how he was involved in this relativistic approach. Because at that time, he told me there is one good student come to Professor Luen to tell him that he want to do his PhD with Professor Luen. And then, but with the one condition, he is interested in relativity. So if there is something in nuclear physics connected with relativistic theory, then he will study the nuclear physics. And then Professor Peterman found this student is so smart. He want to keep this student in nuclear physics. And then he told him, oh, there is nowadays an approach which called relativistic mean field theory. And then the student started to do this PhD with him. And then that is, so this relativistic approach was, was studied. So you will see the students as very, very important in pushing the, the advance of the science. Because the students simply mentioned that he interested in something. And then you found this connection, finally it works. And then that on, if we have, if we, if an physical approach works for actually deformed nuclear, so we should also try to prove that it works if we break in the actual symmetry. That means we have triaction. The reason is why we want to study this triaction nuclear. Yesterday I mentioned about the chiral notation. For this chiral notation nuclear, we need a triaxially deformed nuclear. Therefore, we also investigated this triaxial symmetry. And then, the results in reflection symmetry should be broken. Today, we already heard quite a lot about the nuclear fission, right? For this nuclear fission, we need to break in the reflection symmetry. And then this is the motivation that why 
we should break the, the reflection symmetry. And then, once you broken this, then we need to develop the code to break in the actual and the reflection symmetry simultaneously, right? This is a nuclear theory how it could be developed, because, you know, we do theories that always breaking symmetry. Breaking symmetry always make the knife much more difficult, but meanwhile, it's also very rewarding. And this is the students I, to, um, I told you about, this Kopf. This is the students, he tried to develop this code for notating nuclei. Together with Pittman, he finished his PhD in physics. And uh, you know, this is not so easy because when they're expanding the Dirac wave function, or Dirac spinner in harmonic oscillator potential. They separately expanding the up components and low components. This is okay. But then you will find that up components and low components is connected. They are not independent from each other. So finally, they spend a lot of problem to, so, to realize up component and low components is related. And then this, after you study the, the, the notating nuclear, the development for super deform, uh, deformed notating nuclear and identical bands, that is a natural extension, right? And then magnetic notation, yesterday I mentioned about the, the the spherical nuclear, the notation phenomena in the spherical nuclear, right? So, notating super deformed identical uh, uh, magnetic notation, and also a new word which called anti-magnetic notation, right? Anti-magnetic, if we have time, we will come back to this. And then there is also isostop Isotope shift in night. Isotope shift in night means that if you plot in the radius, isotope shift, the isotope shift is the, the, the difference of the radius for neighboring nucleus. And then <coughs> it's surprising. This, this was found in by experimentalists. So the isotope shift means when you plotting this uh, isotope shift as a function of the, for example, of the neutron number, then for 928, if this is 126, this magic number, there is a kink here. There is a kink here. So. Of night isotope. This is night isotope, and this is in night 208. You see, in that isotope, this, you have a kink. In Pardon? Oh, this is isotope shift. The, Ready, ready, there. This is the radio of the stop shift. I forgot what is this, that R score or something like that. So you will see this is the stop shift, and by other approach, almost all the relativity density functional could give this kink, but all the non relativistic approach fail to give such kink. What, what is the other approach given here is always like this. 
right? So, after this work, almost all the non-relativity density functional begin to refit their functional in order to produce this isotope shift. Therefore, at the beginning, this isotope shift was also uh, put as a kind of uh, kind of success of the relativistic approach. But in fact, uh, this is connected with the automatic appearance of the spin orbit potential. So this isotope shift is something, you know, equivalent to when you're talking about spin orbit potential. Then the shoulder spin symmetry, what I mentioned is that the Chirocchio, because the Chirocchio, first he found the shoulder orbit angle momentum is simply the orbit angle momentum for the low components. And then that time, uh, Girocchio come to us because he want to investigate it, the, the shoulder spin symmetry in deformed nuclei. And then it's interesting, you found that his paper in this, his, his paper is many folks on the, many follow a textbook, but he is very careful. When he derived the equation, he carefully compared the equation motion with the with experimental observation. And then he found the connection between shooter spin symmetry and the Dirac spin loss. And then there are also a lot of dynamical calculations. Uh, for example, the time-dependent approach and the small aptitude application RPA calculation. And very interesting because for quite a long time, all the RPA calculation based on the relativistic mean field that was already started in 1989 or something like that. But the problem is that at that time, the people neglected the Dirac theory. And finally, about 10 years later, they realized the contribution, the, the including the, the negative energy state of the Dirac theory. Then they found they found the similar solution as the TDMF. So that is how the, the relativity mean field for, for this was uh, uh, developed. And then you see, when we're talking about a relativistic mean field, there are two, two kind of things. Before, we always, relativity hard to approach is the exact name of relativistic mean field. Because if you use mean field, if you adopted the mean field approximation, the full term dis disappears. So you always treat the relativistic mean field without the full term. Then without the full terms, then we have found that the pi measurements doesn't contribute because it's a should scale mention the way of related the parities. And then that time people always try to think thinking about the contribution of the folk terms. And then there are several calculation and finally uh, one of my students known he he's uh, he, he did his PhD half of the time in China and a half time in Aussie. And finally, he found that the, the, he built up the density dependent relativistic heart traffic and also relativistic uh, density dependent heart traffic approach. And then he found that uh, relativistic heart traffic and relativistic mean field are equivalently well in describable nuclear property. Furthermore, there is this uh, spin 
this sheaf uh, spin of the splitting, which is connected with the, the tensor part, could be naturally explained after you included the, the fork terms. So that is the Pitney's comments that should everything be reconcreted with the fork terms. In particular, the merit of the fork term is that if you do the, the RPA concretion on top of the RHF, then you will find the, the pi Mason company is already fixed and the mean fit map. Then naturally you can remove one parameters. And nowadays there are also efforts in, in developing localized form of the fork terms in the in the relativistic density functional approach. And uh, this morning Nikola mentioned that uh, what is one reference approach on top of the density relativistic density, density functional there are also works which develop Martin referenced relativistic mean field. This is done by Angram Matum projected and a generate coordinate approach. And uh, one simple version of this is uh, based on the density functional theory, the five dimensional collective Hamiltonian could be developed. In such a way you see all the collective Hamiltonian before was phenomenologically was connected to the microscopical approach. And then recently, fishing is also a hot topic. And uh, several of my students, they studied a couple of years ago. In fact, it's you know, almost seven or eight years ago. And they studied to develop the relativistic approach in 3D lattice. In this 3D lattice, you know, before, if we solve that the equation of motion and harmonic or a Snyder, and then it's very difficult to break the symmetry. But if you solve this equation of motion on 3D coordinate space, then the nuclear could have all kind of shape. That is our advantage. And then, of course, the, the disadvantage is that uh, it take the, it's, the concretion is very time consuming. But with this approach, we can describe, for example, the nuclear clustering inside the nucleus. If the nuclear have some special condition, how the nuclear, you know, uh, take the shape of the linear chain, how the nuclear could be formed a, a, a ring. And uh, then on top of that, if we develop the, the time de dependent covalent density functional, we can also use that to study the, for example, the nuclear fission. And also we also can apply that for nuclear reaction that is the multi-nuclear transform reaction, which is very important for, for synthesis of the super heavy elements. So essentially that is the, that is the, the present status of the relativity density functional. So I hope you, from this development, you get the feeling that the relativistic mean field approach can describe the, not only the ground state, but also the excited state properties. So then I, I started to introduce you a little bit about the formalism. And uh, I realized that there the are also experimentalists sitting in the audience. Or the people don't are not familiar with the field theory and so on, but don't worry. If you are not familiar, then you simply trust me 
everything is correct. And the, the essential sense that maybe we, we, we have to solve some equation of motion. For this part, and uh, Yao Chen, he has already prepared two codes. One, a simple version. You can, you can simply run that for, for the nuclear matter, which is very simple because, uh, as I will tell you, that the equation of motion is extremely simple for nuclear matter because you have the, the translation invariance. And then we can also use that for spherical nuclear. For spherical nuclear, because we have spherical symmetry, so the only degree of freedom is the radius. So you have one, one, uh, the the equation simply a uh, you know a uh, uh, differential equation w w could be easily solved. So. We just follow the historical, historic, uh, historical way to introduce the relativity density function. So the, uh, the relativity main body theory based on a density functional and effective theory for strong uh, for strong interaction. So, so this is essentially how this CDFT was defined. CDFT is a relativistic quantum main body theory, which is based on the density functional theory and the effective field theory for strong interactions. So for the strong interaction, we adopted the, the Meissen exchange version of the nuclear force. We have, for example, we have the, we adopted for most of the time, we adopted the sigma meson, which is a scalar meson, which take care of the attractive part of the nuclear nuclear interaction. And then for the, for the omega meson, which is a, a, a vector meson, which is responsible for the short range repulsive interactions. Then we have isovector, isovector mesons, no mesons, and uh, which take care of about the, the, the difference between proton and neutrons. So essentially using these three mesons, then we can build up the Lagrangian for the nuclear systems. And then, of course, this electric magnetic force, the phonons, uh, photons, uh, should be taken into account as well. Then, if you put this in, in, uh, together, this is the Lagrangian density for the relativistic mean field. The first part, you will see this is uh, for the for the nucleon part. This is the kinetic part of the nuclear. This is nuclear mass, and this is the coupling between the nuclear and the sigma mesons. And this is the 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 coupling of the vector mesons for the omega, and also the no mesons, and also the phonons. And here is the 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 shooter scalar mesons pions. This is a company, and uh, this is a nucleon part. And then this part describes the the sigma mesons. This is a kinetic part, and this uh, the the sigma mass, and this part is for the Omega mesons, and also this is for no, the the no mesons. And uh, then you see that is, this is pi meson and the Coulomb field. And then from this Lagrangian, of course, you can do the transformation 
you can get the Hamiltonians. Here is the Hamiltonian, here is the, the kinetic part, and then this interacting part. This interacting part, you will see, you have the uh, kinetic energy and the potential. This potential, you, you have the uh, you have the two body interaction, two psi is the nuclear spinner, and this is the, the vortex for the for the sigma and uh, for the omega and also the Coulomb field. And this is no Meissons and this is pi Meissons. So from this Lagrangian if we if we quantize the Meissen field, then immediately we can have a Hamiltonian which have the familiar term, uh, familiar forms. So this is the kinetic part, and this is the two-body part. For the two-body part, then we have the so-called the uh, we have the so-called the the direct term, which is the Hartree part. And the folk uh, and the folk part, and from this Hamiltonian, if we assume that the nuclear wave function could be described by a snide determinant, and then from this snide determinant, immediately we can write out the density functional in such a way. This is the kinetic part. This is a sigma, uh, sigma direct term, sigma exchange term, and again this is for omega direct and omega exchange. This is for normal sons, and this is the 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 uh, inertia magnetic field, and this is for the central mass corrections. And then from this from this density functional. Oh, sorry. From this energy density functional, if we do the vari variations, and then immediately we end up the equation of motions. This is the equi direct equation, direct equation for the for the nucleus, and the alpha and the beta are the direct matrix. And P is a momentum operator, V is a vector, mat, a vector potential, S is a scalar potential, and the psi I is the so the so called the Dirac spinner, E epsilon A is the 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 uh, eigenvalues. And here you see if we remove the vector potential and the scalar potential. We already learned that from the textbook. That is the direct equation for the free nucleus. So the only thing is that uh, we wa we we have to treat is the scalar potential, vector potential, and scalar potential. In particularly, this vector potential is connected. You see, with the with the omega meson and uh, the the normal meson and also the Coulomb field. The scalar meson is connected with the, uh, the sigma field. And then the sigma field and also omega and law and the Coulomb field are connected with the all kind of the densities. So this is kind of a coupled equation, of course, very difficult to solve. So here we have to always, we, we have to always assume a kind of the mean field approximation. The mean field approximation is that we assume that we, we already know the vector potential and the scalar potential. Then we can solve this eigenvalue equation. We can get the eigenvalue and the, the drag spinners. And then use this the solution we obtained. We can build the vector potential and the scalar potential and also 
all kind of the potential could be built up. With this potential build up, we can solve the klein golden equation. Then we can get the sigma omega law field. With this field, then we can build a new vector and scalar potential. With this scalar and vector potential, we go back to the Dirac equation. We solve this equation again, and then we get the, 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 the spinner, and then we repeat this problem, this process. Until finally, we achieve self-consistency. Then in such a way, we assume we have, we have solved this nuclear problem. So I mean, I mean how <coughs> if, if we are working, you know, for, for to solve this equation of motion, essentially the knowledge we need is the, the, the mathematical physics we invent. Or we need some numerical recipes for, for code. Then we can handle this problem. The advantage of to solve this equation is that whether we have a deformation, we have a pattern, we have a notation, essentially the equation of motion we solve is essentially the same. Essentially the same. The only thing is that starting from the beginning to simplify the problem, we have to assume what is the symmetry of this system in order to simplify this equation of motion, right? Once we have adopted the symmetry, but you see, e either they are spherical or deformed, depending on, on the beginning, we assume whether we adopted some symmetry or not. Otherwise, the equation of motion are the same. Right? Then this is the so-called Meissong exchanged relativistic mean field, or Meissong exchanged based density function. Right? So sometimes people are not, don't, doesn't like this kind of terminology. The reason is because we have to solve the klein golden equation, right? And also we, we have to explain, we have to answer the question, what is the sigma mesons? Because the sigma meson is not observed. Then what can we do? What we do is that uh, you see, from this klein golden equation, if the mass is big, then formally, if the mass is big, then formally we can get the, the Meissong field by, by this form. In this form, if the mass is too big, so this could be expanded. Then in such a way you see this Meissong field could be, could be expressed in terms of the density, right? So similarly, we can treat in some way in a similar way, then you could say that we can have the Hamiltonian in such a way, then it, from this Hamiltonian, we can express that in terms of the density. Then you will see the, the advantage of this representation is that we don't worry about the Meissen field, right? So what well, in you see this one? You have not mentioned, for instance, chiral symmetry, which you can pose constraints in the kind of uh, form of the phi on W. So, so which are the principles? Are this minimal company? Simply minimal company. Yeah. 
And okay, so, so from this on, you see what we have to solve is the Dirac equations. And then in this Dirac equation, you will see this vector potential and scalar potential are pre represented by all kinds of the densities, right? So in such a way, this is uh, how, to, so to say, the Allene relativity density function of self. And then we can also build this approach in different ways, that, so to say, for example, if we, so to say, we have the, we starting from this building blocks, this Poisson is the wave function, and uh, O is the gamma matrix. Uh, uh, gamma is a matrix, and all this is the isoprene operators. And then we can build all kind of the density and the current. This is isoscalar scalar density, isoscalar scalar vector uh, current, isovector scalar dens uh, density, and uh, isovector vector density. Then we can build the density functional solely in such a way this is kinetic energy, this is a signal order term, high order term, or derivative term. And then, of course, this Coulomb field. So in such a way, we can also build up the relativity density function of so. And then you see, so as I mentioned, the essential thing is this equation of motion, right? This equation of motion we have to solve. Even though we have to deal with the Klein Golden equation, but this Klein Golden equation, if we go to this point coupling version, we don't have to worry about the Klein Golden equation, but pay all attention to this Klein Golden equation. Uh, sorry, to this Dirac equations. So this is the Dirac equation uh, using the Pauli matrix. You will see we ha we can write the the wave function to the up components and low components. And as usual, I, we already know that the scalar potential is about 400 MeV, and the ve vector potential is not passive as 300 MeV. And then for the Dirac wave function for the up part, you will see we have S plus V. This is the, so to say, the Fermi C part. And then this part is the no part, which have the, uh, which have the, the, the 700 MeV. This is Dirac C part. So essentially, this is the equation of motion we have to solve. But before we solve that, we didn't mention yet. So if we, in this uh, density functional, you will see either in the Meissong exchange versions, Meson exchange versions, we have all of this coupling constant here. And also for the for the for the point coupling density functional, we have also have different coefficients before the densities. So we didn't mention yet how to determine these parameters. Determine this parameter is not that easy because this density functional is supposed to use for describing all the nucleus in the nuclear chart. Not only the ground state, but also excited states. So in principle, if we want to determine this coupling constant, the best way is to choose all the nucleus in the nuclear chart, including the ground state property and also excited property 
and put that into the fitting. But then look, how many parameters we have? If for, for the Meissen exchange, and the maximum uh, we have nuclear mass, sigma, omega, no Meissen, this is the coupling constant, and this is nonlinear coupling of the Meissons. And then among them, you see this nuclear mass we know from experiment, and also omega and no Meissen we know from experiment. And also for this nonlinear company, we don't have to take into account so many of them. So roughly, we have less than parameters for the Meissen exchange. So popular in the market, what is normally used is NR3, NRSH, TM1, TM2, PK, PK1, and so on. And then instead of this nonlinear coupling for the Meissons, another way to introduce the density dependence of the coupling constant is that instead of introducing the nonlinear coupling, we could introduce the density dependence of the coupling constant. Then in such a way you see this nonlinear coupling uh, parameter going to the density dependence. The advantage of this density dependence of the Meissen exchange relativistic mean field is that it could avoid unnecessary singularities in the nonlinear versions. As I mentioned, for example, in TDNE in 1974, when they studied the nuclear matters, they found some, you know, pocket in the high density nuclear matter. That is simply because some behavior of this nonlinear coupling constant. But if you go to the density dependent version, you don't have such a problem. And then for the point coupling part, Again, we have the nonlinear parameter parameterization. That is the nuclear mass, and then the, cup, the coefficients for the scalar density, vector density, and uh, all kind of these uh, coefficients are here. And again, we can also put this, uh, this uh, uh, nonlinear high order term into a density dependent part. Then we have all kind of the parameter here. Okay, just one minute. So, so you see, in principle, all of this should be fitted with all the nuclear property. But in practical, it's very difficult. So people normally do is that we choose we choose the ground state property. For example, if we want to put, a, nobody has done that, including the excited properties. And also, most of the case, deformed nuclear are not putting the constraint of the, the parameter as well, because all of this calculation are time consuming. So normally people use is most of the time is that we choose proton or neutron magic nuclear of that mass and several of these radius and then put that as a constraint. For example, the, the density function of PCPG1 is fitted in such a way and proved very successful. And then after you, you have done this, then you see, you can calculate it all kind of physics or observables, like the bending energy, uh, center of mass correction, panel energy, notational correction, and the charge ready, uh, neutron ready, and the proton ready, and e also the deformation parameters. All of this could be done once you have solved the, this equation of motion. Okay, so with this, maybe I just stop here. And if you have main question, please just ask me.
Yes. I mean, because you well. Then maybe you will send the to the all the participants the code. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe next time or tomorrow we can see how this code works. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>